Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, Dave, Marco, and I are going to talk about that freaking awesome graphics card, the GTX 690. Well, I guess that's a spoiler, but come on, seriously. Then we're going to be talking about the HTC One X, contest details, and a whole lot more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It's rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power. I kind of understand this. Welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zaktar alongside Dave Altavilla and Marco Chapetta. How are you guys doing? Not telling you. They're not telling me. That's good. <laughs> Fine. Don't tell me. The audience doesn't care. I guess you guys are breathing, so that's good enough for me. Marco, maybe you'd like to answer this, this very difficult question. How are you? I am good. Thanks for asking. How are you? I am great. That good. is how I'm I am. I'm doing okay, too. I'll let it out. I'm more amazing, kind of like the Spider Man. That's how I am. Anyway. Oh, wow. That's right. Because, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a descriptor, why not just go all out? Anyway, forget that. That's yeah. not relevant at all, is it? Let's talk about something else that's amazing: the Intel SSD 910 PCI Express SSD. See what see what I did there? See what I did there? Double SSDs going on. That's right. It's so awesome. I said it twice because I just read like a monkey. Whatever it says. Well, monkeys don't read. So this is really, really off to a fast start. Let's just move it to Dave, because Dave, why don't you tell me about this Intel 910? Monkeys, everything, man. We get you got a veritable circus going on here. I like this show. Hey, um, so so yeah, the uh, the Intel SSD 910, we, we actually teased it a little bit last episode, uh, as if you recall. But um, actually, this time, uh, I've had uh, plenty of time in the lab with it, and we've been able to uh, run it through its paces in the uh, in the benchmark suites. And it's an impressive uh, first effort for Intel in this arena. Uh, and this is absolutely Intel's first PCI Express based SSD. It's actually a by eight PCI Express Gen two card, so Gen two PCI Express um, and a by eight uh, connector. So you get copious amounts of bandwidth over that interface. And it is a, a triple PCB built uh, uh, slab of silicon. Um, and uh, so you've got this sort of mother card or really what's essentially the base card with uh, the SSD controllers on it. And then a double layer stack of Intel uh, a 25 nanometer flash on top of that, uh, NAND flash. And so uh, all together uh, culminates to some copious amounts of bandwidth uh, and also... Uh, rather expensive for a 400 gig card, 1929, 800 gig card for 3859. Uh, but this thing is blazing fast, um, in excess of a gig and a half write performance, in excess of uh, 1.7 to 2 gig read performance. And um, if you've got to have blinding speed and uh, I/O throughput, this card can offer it for you. Okay, we got crazy speeds. We have a price that's somewhat crazy. expensive. Uh, but I know it's less than competitors out there. But what what's the actual practical application of this? I mean, who's going to get this? This isn't something that you're just going to cram into your your actual computer, are you? Is this something that professionals need? Who who needs this? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I actually, you know, exercised it over a number of different workloads just to see where it excels. And this thing absolutely belongs in the data center. I mean, to be honest. Uh, you know, you certainly could justify this card in a workstation, a high-end workstation application. Certainly, um, you know, crunching some serious HD video or something where you need a lot of uh, sequential uh, bandwidth, sequential read or write throughput. Um, but really, where this thing it sells is high uh, multiple concurrent uh, transactions. So. Really, when you're talking about you know a thousand users banging on a web server, reading and writing in a database application, that's where this card's going to excel. Um, you know, you certainly could justify it in in a workstation, but it's really going to shine. It really stretches its legs under high IOQ depths, or when there's lots of concurrent read and write transactions uh, being uh, accessed on whatever. Um, data is on the card and in this case you know i would suggest you know a, a database server would be perfect we we would love to plug one of these things in to uh power hot hardware actually to uh <laughs> to handle hot hardware's traffic on a daily basis that's that's where this card uh, fits best is that the ssd that you took apart it is we we i disassembled it there was a, a few screws there that uh were just begging to be backed out and yeah actually it it uh it, I put it back together and it still works. So 
Um, I, I live to see another day in the test lab with it, thankfully. <laughs> that, that was my first <laughs> but, question when she showed me that picture. I was like, did you, were you able to make it work again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it went That's back great. together. It's actually, <clears throat> it's actually a very elegant design. Um, Intel did a real nice job with this. Uh, on the baseboard, there's four Intel Hitachi com, uh, sort of joint development um, SSD controllers. And then um, there's also an LSI PCI Express to SAS bridge. The SSD controllers are SAS based, uh, serial attached SCSI. Uh, and so SAS, SSD, or, or, or NAND interface on one side. And then this LSI uh, chip um, is a PCI Express to SAS bridge and uh, allows you to you know, populate a, a standard PCI Express slot with that card. So really what you've got is um, essentially four 200 gig SSDs uh, on a card. And the only downside, the only gotcha that, that I, I really wasn't all keen about was that there's no hardware RAID on board. So you have to set this thing up in an OS and then actually set up a software RAID to um, you know, stripe all those 200 gig volumes on each controller. Uh, in the case of an 800 gig card, for example, uh, and and get uh, your RAID zero set up that way. So, you know, the bandwidth at the end of, at the end of the day was was great. I mean, we saw some some really good numbers. It's actually bested some of the fastest PCI Express cards we've seen from guys like Fusion IO and OCZ in some cases. Lost in a couple other cases. Again, in those applications where the queue depth is a little bit more shallow, and this card doesn't get to stretch his legs as much, but. Um, but yeah, um, you know, really a, a well-built card. Um, you know, we, we would have liked to see some hardware right on board. Maybe that's something that Intel can work in uh, later on down the line with follow-on products. Um, but for the data center, uh, we think Intel's got a winner here for sure. Well, if money's no object, you probably get that SSD for your PC. And if money's no object, you might be looking at the NVIDIA GTX 690. If I remember right, this is the this is pretty much like the flagship now. It's a thousand dollar graphics card. That is apparently unbelievable. Marco, <laughs> what do you know? I know a lot. Before I jump to the 690, though, you had mentioned uh, that the Intel 910 SSD wasn't something you would just plunk in a desktop system. Well, Dave <laughs> would, and it would host his Outlook PST. But that's <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, that's just because so. it's laying around now. Come on, we gotta we gotta yeah, qualify. That, that's that's <laughs> what happens. That's what happens when you run a hardware site. <laughs> so here is the uh, the monster, the GTX 690, and I, I hope this comes across well on camera because not only is this card super powerful, but it's just the coolest card I've ever held. Um, this up here, th these are lighted LEDs. Um, that, that light up with the card. You have oh, this Johnson. slick aluminum housing. You have polycarbonate windows to see the heat sinks that are on top of the GPUs. You have this, this nice fan with you know blades specifically angled to direct air just right through these heat sinks for minimal turbulence and max performance. You know, not only did NVIDIA cram a ton of technology um, onto the board and, and chip level with the GTX 690, but they also really innovated with the cooler and with the enclosure, just, just all around killer card, um, which of course adds to its price, you know, which is why this is a thousand dollar graphics card. You're talking about two GK 104 GPUs, the same exact GPUs that are on the GTX 680 uh, crammed on the card e with each GPU has access to its own two gig frame buffer. So four gigs total on the card. The only real difference between the 690 and a GTX 680 SLI setup are that the GPUs are slightly lower clocked on here. You're talking about you know, 90, 95% of GTX uh, 680 SLI performance from a single graphics card. Okay, so now you, you ran an SLI configuration, right? Because I think there was a picture of two of those in one machine. Were you just that, like drooling over this stuff? Did you have to put it away? <laughs> that was a photo provided by NVIDIA. I did not get to run oh. through it. Now. Darn. That was strictly for the, the the porn purposes to get all the geeks really drooling like myself. <laughs> um, I only exactly total geek porn. I only got to test one, but in reality, man, you only need to test one of these cards. It crushed every game we tested, even on a thirty-inch LCD. I ran some tests across triple monitors. Um, and this single card is able to maintain playable frame rates at a resolution of 5760 by 1080 with max image quality settings and 4XAA enabled. Um, 
basically game developers are going to have to step it up to tax this card. It's just simply a monster performance wise. Do you think the timing has anything to do with uh, Ivy Bridge? Because I mean, that's supposed to have some decent graphics on board, but even that a hundred dollar graphics card could beat. Is this Nvidia is saying like, look, we're going to sh-, like they just announced it pretty much around the same time as Ivy Bridge's actual release. Do you think this is to get people more interested in graphics cards, actual discrete gra- graphics cards, or is this just a coincidence? Um, I, I think it's a little of both. You know, anytime in, Intel does something graphics-wise, you sh- would, should expect the, you know, the GPU makers to say, "Hey, don't forget, we can make these crazy products." Um, but the the announcement came at a big uh, GeForce LAN event in, uh, I believe it was Shanghai, where uh, Jensen Wang announced the card. Um, availability is scarce, but you know, to compare this to what Intel's doing with Ivy Bridge, technically they're both graphics. But it's like comparing a Bugatti to a broken down Fiat in terms of performance. They're, they're, and, and you know what? I don't mean to diss Intel because their integrated graphics and Iverbridge is their best thing that they've done yet. Yeah. But it's you know a tiny fraction of the capabilities and performance oh, yeah. of a monster like the GTX 690. Yeah, I think, I think when I saw the GTX 690 come out, I'm like, okay, you know what? People might not get that immediately, but they'll be thinking about graphics cards again and go, I can't afford that, but maybe I'll get my own. Maybe I'll get a new card because the new ones are still pretty dang good, especially because look, in- integrated graphics, like you said, are not going to reach these things ever. Yep. Uh, let, let's talk about gaming. Let, let me just go one no. more quick second. No, one never, more quick never go ahead. No, you just you, you made you made a point. <laughs> you, you reminded me of a point that I you know I, I'd like to get across to, to a lot of different people when I'm talking about systems. Um, discrete graphics are an interesting thing. It's it's kind of something you need to experience to understand why you want to invest in a discrete graphics card. You know, I had nephews that were console gamers, and they, you know they they laughed when I told them the PC was more powerful. Yada yada yada. Until I built them systems and said, okay, play on these, now they love their PCs and they, and they get it. So, you know, the GTX 690 is, is not a card that, uh, it's not for everybody. It's, it's a flagship, insanely powerful card, 1000 bucks. It's going to be difficult to justify spending $1,000 on graphics. But it's the kind of thing when you experience a game running at these ultra high resolutions with the best image quality possible, you realize how much better the PC is than other platforms and how much work the GPU makers have put into these kind of products. Yeah, but you got to have fun games, right? you got to make sure they're not falling into like horrible cliches. Because if you're going to see it in great resolution, you're going to have great frame rates. The game should be fun. But you yes. guys at Hot Harbor took a look at some cliches that should die. <laughs> they need to go away from games because they've been done. That's why they call cliches. Dave, what do you got? Ah, uh, th- those are strong words, you know. When when you when you when you talk about hate and dying and all that stuff, it's those are your uh, words. I, the top yeah, words. it's yeah, it's really it's really really kind of coarse. But uh, Joel Fruska, our resident uh, Andy Rooney, uh, if you will, <laughs> uh, actually stepped out with uh, a piece that really resonated with the audience, and we were we were very happy to see the reaction to this piece, good and bad. I mean, there are a lot of folks that are that are passionate about this, and we got some very interesting responses from folks that completely agreed with Joel's take, uh, which is, you know, there, there's lots of cliche sort of crutches that uh, game developers have relied on for so many years to uh, create their, their worlds uh, to, 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 to pull us in and to make the storyline work in the gaming uh, world rather than, you know, obviously you're, you're recreating what's supposed to be an, an immersive uh, real uh, life environment. Um, there, there's some crutches they had to rely on. And so... Um, and then we also got some folks that took issue with with Joel's approach uh, or suggestions, which hey, if you if you want to make these things more complicated and take away some of some of these crutches, if you will, I'm calling them crutches, um, you're you're going to end up spending a lot more money on game development because you have a lot more trees you have to uh, script out and uh, possibilities to deal with. And, um, you know, so it's going to elongate the time for game development and increase the cost of game development as well. Uh, But Joel stepped through what I call these crutches that uh, game developers have relied on. And, you know, it really, really hit home and and makes us think, you know, games that the way they're designed today, why are we still sort of putting up with this? Scripted scenes, conveniently indestructible objects, mandatory success, fetch and requests, uh, our fetch quests and the chosen one, or, or you know, uh, I, I should say, you know, your your 
master tells you, you got to go over here and get this and bring it back to me, or you know, here's a here's an assignment, uh, sort of thing. And then oblivious NPCs or non-player characters. Uh, these are some of the crutches that that game developers rely on, and and uh, that that are starting to wear thin on our arguably picky gamer. Uh, minds these days. <laughs> yeah, the, I think there was something called what, un, is it unbreakable glass syndrome or something strange like yeah. that. I forget what it was called, but yeah. I, I remember running into that in lots of different games, and I'm like, well, yeah, I could see why it does take time. But you know, when you do have a weapon that destroys everything else, and then you can't somehow turn a doorknob, it's it just it just messes with you. I think these games have gotten advanced enough that, that you want the whole world to be immersive, and if you can't interact with everything, and you have these dumb characters running around or these similar things it you know after a while i have a hard time justifying like buying a game because like didn't i play this already doesn't this happen all the time what should people do though can they if it could there be a game that removes all of these things and would that actually be fun or will you get lost forever you know i i think i think there's a lot that can be done and i, I think what joel's point you know is, is sort of high level point in this whole thing was look we're spending Hundreds of thousands of dollars on cutting edge graphics, and you know Marco just got through talking about the GeForce GTX 690, and you know I mean this there's unbelievable GPUs and really great eye candy, and all of that is important. You know certainly, um, you know the graphics uh, are important and 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 provide impact, but gameplay that's what we're talking about in this article. Gameplay is vitally important. You can make something look as gorgeous and pretty as you want. And then at the end of the day, it's going to be like, a, you know, a guided tour, a glorified guided tour of beautiful landscape or whatever it is you're, you happen to be rendering, um, you know, on that GPU. And so, you know, there's some there's some things that, that just, as you noted, I as break the experience, scripted scenes, you walk into a room, uh, you know, a head crab falls on you, you know, eat your brain, whatever, and you turn into a zombie. You can't affect that instance. Uh, and so, you know, or, or that happening, that event. And so as a result, you know, you're stuck with the end result of whatever that scripted scene was, um, you know, conveniently indestructible objects, non-breaking glass, stuff that should be destructible in the real world that that doesn't fit with reality, that doesn't feel right. Mandatory success. There's another one. Uh, Joel talked about how Deuce X, uh, Human Revolution, it was a very good uh, game in this regard, and that mandatory success wasn't required. And he he made reference to this this woman that you met, and you have the ability to either save her life, a, uh, save her life. A guy had a gun to her head, or not. And guess what? If you fail, life goes on. You know, and and people start doubting your ability to handle the 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 mission at hand. Uh, but you know, you didn't have to let you know. You didn't have to sit there and watch this woman's fate unravel in front of you. You actually could either take uh, you know action with it or not. And so that felt you know more like the real world. Um, oblivious MPs, NPCs, non-player characters. This is my favorite one, and I've got to read you a little ex- excerpt from from Joel's article because it's too hilarious and and really drives home the point. Um, when you talk about uh, let's see. Let, let me just get to the point where it is. So, in in real life, he says, for example, you know, about an, an oblivious NPC or a non-player character, a character in the game. In real life, criminals make decisions about who they will and won't waylay based on the person's size, bearing, and estimated capability of defense or violence. If you make a living robbing people, this is a vital job skill, which is why it's hilarious when would-be muggers pick the wrong targets. He says, in Skyrim, I wear pieces of dragon I killed. I've got a demonic horse, an undead assassin helper monkey. I can fling giants off a cliff with a well-articulated belch. And I have the second deadly companion who follows me around like a pack mule. He says, you, on the other hand, have a broken sword and a badly stained pair of pants. What are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, is, is, your, is your NPC going to attack this obviously strapped to the teeth uh, opponent? No, of course not in the real world, but too often uh, uneven matches like that happen and, and outcomes happen that, you know, just shouldn't be allowed and take, take you out and, you know, pull you away from, the, uh, from being immersed in that game environment as a result. You, you get woken up from the reality just a little bit to say, uh, that doesn't work. Let's pull so. the audience away from the, game, the horrors of gaming cliches and move on <laughs> to a phone. The HTC One X that runs on AT and T. Marco, now you actually reviewed the One X. It seems to be in your hands right now. You have yes. the white model. 
I that. do, and you can see how buttery smooth it is. I can't see what I'm uh, swiping on here. Hold on. It stops. There we go. There we go. It, it's just such a slick, well-designed phone. Um, this is the AT&T model HTC One X. Um, unlike the international One X, which runs the Tegra Three, um, this does not. This is a dual-core phone, um, but it's running a dual-core a Qualcomm Snapdragon S4, the the latest iteration of Qualcomm's SoC, which is powered by dual crate cores, so a new generation of mobile processors manufactured at 28 nanometer. So although if you look at specs and say dual core 1.5 gigahertz doesn't look all that much faster than other phones, um, it is way faster than previous gen dual core phones. Um, the GP, the Adreno 225 GPU on the SoC is also clocked higher than some others and GPU performance is also excellent. Um, in addition, you know, I, I like to experiment with lots of different ROMs on my other phones um, and I've been playing with a few ICS ROMs on my Samsung devices and they, you know, they're not released publicly, uh, you know, at least as, in, as far as uh, over-the-air updates. Um, but the leaks are just so not polished. Uh, I have force close issues and performance issues. Um, the release of ICS on the One X with HTC Sense 4.0, it just feels polished to me. It's so smooth and buttery. Performance is great. The, the, the overlay, is, it's not overly obtrusive uh, over the ice cream sandwich uh, experience. Um, performance all around is very good. Um, although it's an LTE device, I found that it, it could last a full day um, with moderate usage. Uh, and performance on the network, if you are in an AT&T LTE area, performance was stellar. I pulled down 37 megabits down and almost 14 up. It was just, wow. it was nuts for a phone. Now, yeah, I want that phone. This this <laughs> this One X, this is HTC's like hero phone they went away from the we have millions of things we're going to go with the one line which is kind of a strange thing because they have multiple ones the x the v <laughs> the s uh, that's kind of a, i think that's just a silly aside but now this the phone oh i disagree with you but go ahead uh okay well the the uh this phone though it's got some serious competition coming out the samsung just introduced their galaxy s3 it has a similar form factor with a 4.8 inch screen international version will have a quad core likely to have a dual core in america uh, is is the HTC One X uh, good enough that people should be going for that now, or should they be freaking out and go, oh, well, the Samsung Galaxy S3 is around the corner? Uh, yeah, it is good enough to go for now, in my opinion. But you said uh, you know you disagree with what HTC's done with the naming, and uh, in fact, they've done exactly what Samsung did with the Galaxy brand. You know, Samsung has a ton of <laughs> Galaxy devices. It's kind of a, you know a single brand umbrella to encompass a family of products, and that's just what HTC did. Instead of walking in and saying, "Oh, you know, the HTC Incredible or the Inspire," you know, do you, are are they both HTC phones? What's they seem totally different in terms of their name, even though internally maybe they're similar. Now you can walk in and say, oh, I heard the HTC One is a good device, and boom, it'll be there. You don't, you're not going to have similar phones with totally different names across different networks. Um, but you know, that's, that's a different argument. Now, in, in yeah, terms can, of – Can I jump in on that? I, I think that's – no, I think that's a good point, and, and that's one of the things that always you know, sort of – I wish manufactured manufacturers were a little bit more clear. I mean, you you hear about all these names, Inspire, Sensation, Incredible, and all these real. You know, this one's incredible. This one's sensational. This one inspires me. You know, it's what does it mean? And so, I actually think it's a great idea. You know, go to that that one brand, and then within that one brand, you break out. You know, different subsets of uh, the phone, and it's it's much clearer to the to the consumer. It's a little bit more of an organized. Uh, approach, I think. So, anyways, go ahead. Only I'm sorry. because I'd like to argue real quick. The reason why I think the one branding is, is silly is because of the actual branding one. If they had chosen a different word, I probably would be fine with that. But the fact that uh, there are multiple see. ones is the strange uh, <laughs> thing to me. Uh, if Galaxy is uh, yeah. broad enough that you could have a variety of topics, a variety of versions, that is. But to say, oh, you don't want that one, you want the other one. You want the it's, other one. <laughs> but it's easy when you go to the store. Do you have the HTC one? Like, yeah, we have an HTC one. But anyway, back to the question, which was <laughs> yeah, Galaxy S3 yeah. versus HTC uh, One X. Yeah, I just forgot the name right there, the One X. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it seems pretty pretty amazing. So is, is, should people be waiting or not? Um, I don't think so. So they're, they're two very different devices. Um, Samsung sort of go, has gone their 
their traditional route. They made the phone bigger, better, more powerful. Um, I have not held an S3 in my hand yet, so I don't want to pretend like uh, you know I'm an expert on it. But the you know the One X kind of went in a different direction. Uh, this phone it is super thin. It's super light. They've kind of you know go on the Apple route as far as uh, you can't expand the memory and you can't swap out the battery. So that's a negative. But, you know, I don't know a ton of people that carry multiple phone batteries around, nor do I know a ton of people that fill up their 16 gig phones. So I think somebody going shopping for a phone that just wants a great experience, something thin, something light, something that looks great, there's no reason to not experience the HTC One X. It is a, it's an excellent device. Now, as far as the S3 goes, it really looks like Samsung pulled all the stops, man. You know, it's a quad core uh, Exynos processor, a uh, higher clock GPU, uh, beautiful screen. And although, you know, a 4.8 inch screen is going to sound huge to some people, they, they did manage to shrink the bezels a little. So it's only a little bit larger uh, than the Skyrocket. And, you know, the HTC One X is a little bit larger than this than the Skyrocket. So I don't know. Now that I have to just uh, go back to something that I did this weekend. I reprogrammed or I flashed a few ROMs on a friend's Galaxy Note um, over the weekend, and I got to play with that giant for a few days. And five inches is definitely too big. But then I oh, go yeah. back to the to the One X and the Skyrocket, and I could see, okay, maybe they can go a little bigger. And for my hand, I'm wondering if Samsung hit the sweet spot with a 4.8 but a smaller bezel. I really need to feel it to experience it, but uh, I'm not quite sure yet. Massive phones mean massive batteries to keep those things going. I think that's one of the reasons people like having a removable door so you can put on a bigger battery. Because the first version of LTE phones, those things were just sucking on batteries like crazy. So yeah. Marco, the Marco, question though. for it, you. Sure. Uh, do, at, at four, at four seven or four eight, do, do you think you can put that thing in your pocket and be comfortable with it? I carry a Skyrocket around in my pocket with a case on it, no problem. Really, I, I, you know, I have a, I have a um, Samsung Infuse 4G, and it's a 4.5 inch phone, and I always feel like the thing is just, you know, flapping around in my pocket. It's, it's really big. I'm thinking 4.3 is a little, is more optimal for me, but you know, but, I mean, I love the screens; they're gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's great to have the real estate, but it, the convenience of putting it in my pocket, I don't know. It's, it's a tough one. <clears throat> you know, now that I've gotten to play with a few devices side by side by side in, in a, you know, a short span of time. I, I think I can go a little bigger for you know for my hand than four seven five inch. As cool as the Galaxy Note is, I think it's a cool device. It's just a little too big, so I I, I need to experience the Galaxy S three. I have a feeling Samsung's got a, a home run on their hands there. Well, these are massive devices, but you know what's even bigger? Tablets are bigger. That's right. <laughs> yeah, baby. What if what if you wanted to get a free tablet? How could you possibly do that, Dave? Is there any kind of contest going on? Perhaps that I don't know. If you wanted a tablet. Maybe somebody watching this could somehow get a tablet for free. By gum, I think you're you're onto something there. Oh, I good. <laughs> this would have been very awkward <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Uh, yeah, no, actually, we've got Hot Hardware's Tegwa Three Tablet Spring Sweepstakes. Easy for me to say. Win an Asus Transformer Prime, or uh, as a runner-up, gosh, here's a consolation prize for you: an Acer Iconia Tab A510. Uh, both come with their own $25 Amex gift card, which you can go ahead and hop on Google Play and download apps and stuff to your heart's content. Um, the Asus Transformer Prime is Amethyst Gray. It's a 32 gig with dock. And uh, again, that's a Tegra 3 tablet, that um, five core, four plus one architecture that uh, does so well in the benchmarks and uh, really with ice cream sandwich under the hood uh, provides a really nice tablet experience. Uh, and also the uh, Acer Iconia Tab A510. Uh, again, really nice tablet. They're both 10-inch machines. And uh, don't have to do a whole lot to get in. Just uh, make sure you're registered at hothighware.com. Uh, a little Facebook liking here or there if you're if you're not already a fan of our page. Uh, we do have a Google Plus page now, which we've provided links to on the site. Google's got to work out the, the name for uh, company pages. The, ours is like some cryptic little, you know, serial number or whatever. But um, we have links in the site. You can get to it. And uh, putting us in your circles on Google will get you noticed as well as commenting in the hot hardware community. That's most important. Uh, we are trying to kind of scour the contestants for sort of best 
community members that are contributing and, uh, you know, good folks to have around. And those are the folks we like to reward with prizes. So see if you can get in and win one of these babies. The full contest details are available at hothardware.com. And that's also where you'll find all kinds of articles, like everything we talked about. Guess what? Those things were actually from hothardware.com. That's right. I know you've been wondering, where do we get this great content? (laughs) <laughs> we got you covered. See, it's not a problem. But like Dave was saying, Hot Hardware is all around the web. There's Facebook.com slash Hot Hardware. There's Twitter.com slash Hot Hardware. There's Dig.com slash Hot Hardware. There's YouTube.com slash Hot Hardware Vids. And if you go to Google+, Plus, you just do a quick search for Hot Hardware. It'll pop up right there. And yes, they don't. They give you that ridiculous uh, serial number, as you put it. I quite like that. It's too bad you don't. You can't have like a Vandy Leet Speak version of it. Because there you got go. numbers anyway. Why not Leet Speak? We should find out what your what your uh, what your serial number spells at some point. Maybe it's something hilarious or not. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, well, that does it for us. I think we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for stopping by.